Good evening. I'm Reverend Dr. Donna Patterson, the Anamkara Chaplain in Residence here at Scarrett Bennett. And I am very pleased this evening to welcome you, whether you are here with us in person or virtually attending this, this reading. I think you will be in for a delightful evening. Poet, playwright, and editor Linda Parsons will be our poet for tonight. She's a Nashville native and has been living in Knoxville for quite a few years. She's the poetry editor for Madville Publishing and the copy editor for Chapter 16, the literary website of the Humanities Tennessee. Linda is Linda published is in such journals, journals as, as the Georgia, Georgia Review, the, the Iowa, Iowa Review, Review Prairie, Prairie Schooner, Schooner Southern, Southern Poetry, Poetry Review, Review, the Chattahoochee Review, Review Baltimore, Baltimore Review, Review, and Shenandoah. And Shenandoah. Her fifth poetry Poetry collection is Candescence. And I I want to say, say if uh, you've looked looked at our website website and looked at at her, um, uh, uh, the the marketing marketing on Linda's Linda's uh, page, page, you can can, uh, uh, download, download, look at some of the 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 websites websites to to see, see, let's read read some of her poetry. And And I was was reading reading some of her work and it's like a wondrous walk in nature. Um, um, so I look, so I look forward, forward to hearing more. more. Linda, Linda. Welcome. welcome. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Um, um, What a joy, what a joy to, to discover, discover, even though I'm a Nashville, Nashville native. native. As Donna, As Donna said, said uh, I didn't know about the Scarab Bennett Center. Center. And, and uh, what, what a lovely a oasis, oasis of peace and beauty right here, right here in, the, in, in the heart of the city. So delight to roam around uh, a bit and uh, walk, walk the labyrinth, the labyrinth there, there in the center, center of everything. everything. So, so uh, thank you so thank much you so for much having me. me. Uh, uh, thank, thank all, all my, my dear friends, friends and dear family, and family for coming tonight. tonight. This, is, this the is the first road trip, road trip and, and in-person, in-person poetry, poetry reading, reading that I've had in like, like, I want to say like say close to two years. And so, and so I'm here, I'm here to, be, to be uh, bringing, uh, bringing my, work my work to my hometown, my hometown of Nashville, Nashville. and, and um, um, to have to some have family some here, which is a real joy. joy. Um, that, that is like, well, you know, know, a real cause, cause for, celebration for celebration all the way, all the way around. around. So thank, thank you, you all for coming. For coming. As, Alice As Alice said, we're said, kind of having a coming out party because we're all slowly venturing out into the world again. Some faster than others, but... Thank you for thank being you here for tonight, being and thank you for, thank you for uh, those of you who are watching virtually tonight. So I'm going to uh, read mostly new work this evening, but I'll read a little bit from my two most recent books. Um, my maternal grandmother was um, really special in my young life, all of my all of my life, and. Um, <clears throat> So I spent a lot of time at her house, and we would sit on her front porch. This was in East Nashville on Russell Street. Um, And we would break beans, we would uh, shuck corn, do various things. And often in the evening, when the cicadas were doing their beautiful rising and falling of sound, um, but she called them jar flies. I grew up calling them jar flies. Um, So this poem is a generational poem. I have my grandmother and now I'm a grandmother as well. So I'm kind of standing between those two worlds. Midsummer. Under the old red bud in the boulevard, sound, umbrellas our heads lifted as to thunder. Near, oh near, they cry above us. And together, though deaf in their midst, we speak the names we have learned in lives brief and long. Cicada, says my granddaughter, given by her mother. Jar flies, I counter, word my grandmother broke with half runners on newsprint spread in our laps, far so far on that glider, that porch, those burnished evenings. 
in the dying down, the four-year-old affirms the stamp of science. No, cicada. Not yet sure-footed in the gloaming, the papers will flatten with corn shucks, oil can she'll fetch for our rocking to and fro. In the new ringing, like all deepness wrung from pitched joy, we look and look for the red eyes, the jewel wings, near, oh near, in the shattered, still-lit night. My grandmother worked in the textile industry, and I worked at a men's shirt factory, Allen's Shirt Factory, in Nashville for, um, for decades. She was, for a lot of that time, a buttonholer. And so she would sit at her machine, and that blade would come down and cut the buttonholes, and then that was her job to very quickly do the stitching all around that. One of the things that I have from her house um, is her old house coat, this, this chenille hot pink thing that hangs in my closet. So it's like a bedspread, really. And so when I open my closet door, I, I can see her, I can feel her there. Um, my grandmother's house coat. No one else's arms could fill these sleeves. No other shoulders broad as a mule driver's, shouting gee and haw all day to the factory buttonholer. The workhorse of her body circling home to this tufted chenille. House coat, she would say, not robe. Word of the middle class, whose dim surface her life barely rippled. Coral rosettes swirled down the front, belied her scuffle to light the flame at five. Doors shut to unheated rooms, her chug to the bus stop. I've clocked my time, hunched at a desk in violet fluorescence. But I've not spun the sameness of men's shirts in a hurricane of lint and bobbins, making production under a foreman's squint. I've not bowed to the unraveling of missed stitches, stuck gearbox and pulley, docked pay. In my closet, years after her death, robe shapeshifts to housecoat, hung loose before the whistle blast, before she slips inside. Sometimes I sink into its rag batting, dwarfed by cuffs and waist. I drape myself in its tired embrace, used Kleenex, still bald in the pocket. <clears throat> so uh, that was from my fourth collection, The Shaky Earth. And I'm going to read a few new poems now, a couple of poems from my father, who was a uh, traveling salesman for all of his adult career. And for this poem, I've used a, uh, this is another summer, summer poem, and I've used an epigraph from James Agee's A Death in the Family, um, A.G. being a Knoxville native. So A.G. wrote, We are talking now of summer evenings in Knoxville, Tennessee. In the time I lived there, so successfully disguised to myself as a child. The hissing of Knoxville lawns. Off Broadway, north of the city, I carry jugs to my assigned neighborhood tree, the wine-colored chokeberry. Hobbled in 93 degrees, I breathe in the cool sewer, its rush to First Creek, then the forks coil to form the Tennessee. I left my mother's people in the Nashville basin for Knoxville at 11 straddled the plateau, 
surged like the muddy Cumberland to get here and root. I wait till dusk to water my own trees, red bud, dogwood, paper bark, maple. Uncoil the hose like A.G.'s father on Highland Avenue, a little bit mixed sort of block. All the fathers out on their summer lawns, collars removed and necks shy, the bright bell of spray, a call and response to cicadas risen wine. Like my own father, using the old name Hosepipe, rinsing the road off the Buick, home from traveling the southeast, his satchel and pamphlets unpacked. We don't think of these moments, how I sat snug as the car warmed up, as he scraped the winter ice, how the hose rang in his hands those dusty days, until we stand in that very spot and open the spigot, until the arc of water is pure rainbow, peach to indigo, and we are carried back and back to ourselves, undisguised. And another poem for my dad. Um, the last 15 or so years of his life, he suffered from vascular dementia. And so I was his main um, caregiver during that time. He moved around to various assisted living facilities and then in the end to the nursing home. And it was very hard to watch that descent, I'm sure, if you have, have had loved ones in that situation. It's a very hard thing to witness. They feel helpless in trying to understand what's happening to them, and you feel just as helpless trying to help them through. So his last couple of years, he spent a few times in the hospital. And um, <clears throat> this is one of those times he was in the ER. His name was Philip Lee, and his nickname for <clears throat> all of his life, really, mainly by his parents, was Pi Lee. Pi Lee. Through the bed railing, our game to pass time in the ER. He pokes out a hand, we shake, he draws back laughing. Nearly midnight in the ER, again my father slips to the fence of his old backyard, reaches to the little neighbor girl who peels foil from juicy fruit. So young, she is unable to say his full name, Philip Lee. She pokes gum through the wire, draws back laughing. Pi Lee, Pi Lee, you can't catch me. Unable to say his name, my father crisscrosses the wiring in his brain. It's young lights long past midnight's hour. So long our wait, he draws back the rumpled bedsheet, floor blue cold beneath his feet. Our game pokes time through uncertain gain. Little child I tend this night rails against those lesser lights. All the girls he might catch just past his reach, growing so like tendered fruit the other side of the fence. I found that in writing, um, this was from my uh, current collection, Candescent, and I found that uh, in writing, especially emotional work, most often about my parents, that it helps to write in form. Uh, a little bit of rhyming, perhaps a sonnet, and in this case, both some internal rhyming as well as uh, my version of a, what's called a pantoum, which is um, uh, certain lines and words are repeated throughout the poem, but each time in a slightly different way. So that kind of helps create some distance, a little emotional distance, so that you can shape the art 
and get fully into the mystery of it without getting too bogged down in the emotions. So, <clears throat> And I have done some pandemic work, um, both poems and a little bit of prose during this last year. Um, this next poem was inspired after I had heard a news cast where people are going to their dentist because they're under so much stress for so many reasons, of course, um, during last year especially, and they're cracking their teeth and their fillings and they're grinding their teeth in their sleep. And so at the same time, I needed a night guard. Um, so all of those things work together for the poem. And this is also a dream piece. Night Guard. Who knew my dreams needed reining in, galloping symbol and precipice, until after decades of TMJ, my jaw began to crumble. Like so many these pandemic days, who clinch and grind, crack molars and fillings. I clicked the new night guard in place to stay the bone loss. Though at 3 a.m. I spit this foreign bit on the extra pillow, ride on unhaltered. I dream no fear at the departure gate, shoulder to shoulder as in my old life off to the midi Pyrenees near Toulouse, along the ancient pilgrimage. But there's a summer snow, at least a foot, and I didn't pack boots. My parents would send them, but they're off being new incarnations. And I'll never again hear their voices. DiMaggio's fly ball at Sulphur Dell, nutmeg, not clove in the cobbler, except the wishing voice in my head, mouth locked in stasis. I'll never know whether night guards or hog ties me, lathered to the brink of prayer, staying neither hope nor haint, whether the watches hover until I awaken, or if in the wee hours and more gnashing of teeth, I can't help myself and spit it out. Over about the last uh, three, almost three and a half years, I lost all three parents, my father, my mother, and my stepmother, who I was very close to. So it's been a, a rough, rough time for losing, losing dear ones. Um, this poem was inspired after a friend, and she really isn't um, <clears throat> someone that I see very often, but she had uh, suddenly lost sight in one of her eyes. And she contacted me and asked if I would do a healing ceremony in my garden. And I've been a gardener for many years, for about 30 years. So I had never done anything like that before, but I said that I would give it a good shot, you know. Uh, I knew that it was important to her, and it became important to me as well. Garden medicine. Near dark, I spread my stones on the wicker table, adventuring for blood in the eyes, amethyst for grounding. Rose quartz honed to prism. The lit sage winds pure and white to the cupola. Gazebo feathered with tall flocks, begonia, spent lunaria. My friend has asked a prayer, a blessing to call back her sight from its heavy curtain. I spread my ceremony as night shadows call vessels to untangle iron and salt, the muscle of heart to unknot, windows flung open to blessed light. I'm not a healer, though maybe I am. My ordinary hands laid on the scathing past to cool its sear, 
my palms a bowl, cupping the last drop of day in blind descent. Come, hawks wrought vision, freshet flow and release. Bless even the mockers harangue as I enter the garden. Huff at my shoulder and head. Huff the air split and attack, even in dreams. Bring us all to the nest, woven scrap and moss. Uncover our eyes so that we may see the scales drop to the compromised ground. And so what new thing that I've been doing for um, this uh, current collection that I'm working on that I've just actually has, have pulled together my sixth book uh, is to work in some bits of prose in with the poems. I took a wonderful workshop last fall. It was an online workshop and it was called the COVID Garden Story Project, led by Rebecca, um, Rebecca Howell. And so um, this was our, um, we gathered uh, weekly, and every day we wrote, we were to write of our feelings, our impressions, not only during COVID, but in relationship to our time as being in the garden. <clears throat> And so what these pieces have done, these essayettes, as we call them, uh, they are like in conversation with the poems, and they also expand the world of the poem. So it's been a wonderful, um, not only an exercise for me to expand my writing, but to uh, make it a part of what I do now. So I'm calling these pieces uh, Visitations. And so the titles, each one is Visitation, colon, and then a word that captures uh, what's happening in the essay. So this is Visitation Winged. The birds were more aggressive this spring and summer of isolation. Though aggressive to me is merely protecting bald babies in the mini nests tucked into burning bushes, hydrangeas, and hollies, the weed tree that towers over the fence line. Especially the mockers, their ice pick beats, beaks, their sleek dive bomb from phone and cable lines. I time my weeding and trimming to their hunting hours, gauging whether the coast is clear from the back door. Sometimes I miscalculate Huff at my head, huff at my back and shoulder. I scold and shoo. I use an umbrella, no good for two-handed weeding, but fine for taking out the trash. I borrow my granddaughter's bike helmet to mow to the car and back on rare errands, my purse over my head. Then the babies fledge, the parents quiet. In the leeks and brandy wines, I still duck and cover by instinct. I look to the skies for sharp winged threats. Maybe this global period of alertness, wariness, and shrinking from other human contact during the pandemic has imprinted on our consciousness, our reflexes. Maybe it will be years before our muscles fully relax when entering a store or crowd, our impulse to fight or flight embedded in our brain's synapses. Huff, huff. Tell me, when will we come through this long night and break our fevered pitch? When will my hand reach out to yours? as we stand tall and bareheaded once again. So in the summer, I just have to write about cicadas because they're my spirit animal. Um, <clears throat> the whole idea of emergence, of being down in that dark place, of gathering, gathering whatever they're doing and ready to have that time of rebirth. 
uh, and the voice, the sound. Uh, and of course, there's that association with the time I spent with my grandmother. To me, they're the very epitome and symbol of summer. So um, another cicada poem. And this time, I used a little bit of our dear Margaret Rankle's um, 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 New York Times um, column. She writes a regular Times column now. She is a, a Nashville writer who's written in many genres here in the city. So uh, this column appeared, and she was making the case for the fact of the brood X or brood 10 cicadas that, no, it's not an infestation. It's miraculous. And so this is from her column at that time. At the height of the emergence, the sound appears to come from everywhere and nowhere at once, vibrating in the bones of your ears and in the fillings of your teeth. Everywhere and nowhere at once. On day 11 of the Chopra 21-day meditation series, the Sanskrit mantra Om Shanti says, I radiate perfect peace. Tell that to the basement guys jackhammering concrete for new drainage pipes and pump, the years old seep of groundwater into floor and foundation. Through the harangue of metal on rock, joists rattle their tibias, teacups their saucers. Deepak urges me to access deep peace from within. His silk voice prods me to befriend the sound, to be the Sufi of sound. Silk woven into rope saying to pull myself from the shattered past, hand over hand, into good air, to stand in the only now, everywhere and nowhere at once. From the sodden earth, I re-emerge with brood X cicadas feeding on roots these 17 winters entombed, an ecstasy of wings starved for summer. Maples and oaks and trumpet vine vibrate their dervish of brief being. And I, reaching down to my damp cellar, release all the noise, the unrequited, the unforgiven. My new body trembles, flooded with sun. I was actually very disappointed. Our neighborhood did not get the brood X. They were everywhere around us. They were like, you know, this thick in lawns and on people's porches and everywhere and on their cars and every, the dogs eating them and everything. They did not come to our neighborhood. So, uh, but our regular cicadas did come. So anyway, um, and as I mentioned in one of the other pieces, um, I went to live with my father and stepmother when I was 11. And so my oldest granddaughter is now 12, but all last year I remember thinking about her being 11, being the same age that I was when I made this momentous move and change in my life, uprooted myself, and thinking of how very young she is and just in disbelief as to how I could have made that decision at that age. Um, so this is Checkers with my granddaughter. She's not out for blood, but like her father, a natural strategist, and soon has me in her grasp. This lithe player at 11 paints me into a corner. Her proud red battlements, mine hapless black. Sometimes, you have to sacrifice, she says. It's not that I lack attention or forethought. I see in her the girl I was at the same age, inching square by square away from the only life I knew, 
a checkerboard of attack and evade, my mother's war of attrition, my stepmother's detente. I waver on the board. It's time to sacrifice, my granddaughter repeats. She double and triple jumps me just as I leapt from one mother to another into my father's good graces, the playing field strewn with uncountable dying and wounded. I yield to a girl, still a stranger, to grief and loss. I crown her victory yawp. <clears throat> and so I have another, um, <clears throat> another little essayette. Um, and my, my mother uh, passed in January of this year. So this was written before, slightly before that time. Visitation, mother. Today I barely beat the rain to cut back a wild haired spirea, chartreuse in spring and summer with snowflake flowers. But in that spot, under a neighbor's weed tree, it always darkens with a fall fungus. I stuff the black stalks in the bin, step on lemon balm and oregano. Their scents commingle like dinner on the grounds, like a flag raised among the wounded. Sometimes the field of our story is equally ruined. We are sometimes the leaving and sometimes the left. At 11, I left my troubled mother for my stepmother's olive branch. Between us, a singed no man's land of attrition. When I see my mother now in the nursing home, we want to get close and touch. She marvels at my hair, the same blinding white. She knows that something happened in our past, but over the blaring TV, she can't quite put her finger on it. To get to her, I walk through the waist I chopped off in light rain until my arms ached. I lean to speak in her good ear. I can't say her voice is the balm of, of herbs crushed underfoot, a voice that once froze me to the bone. I can't say the air of bodies waiting to die doesn't make me sick, but a little peace creeps in. Along the way, I have been both the leaving and the left. The seed and the dung, both needed to till the ground and bear fruit. My mother lets herself stand in the field of some small memory of a daughter she lost. I let myself take her silky hand. And so I have come to the end. I will uh, read this last piece. And this is a very new poem. Um, and surprise, another cicada poem. So uh, <clears throat> I was out one evening and um, at the time of dusk of the gloaming, which is really my favorite time of day. And the words of uh, the hymn, softly and tenderly came to me. And I used to spend uh, very often Saturday nights with my grandmother. And um, the next morning then we would go to church and I would stay with her in her Sunday school class. And of course during the church service and I would usually fall asleep in her lap and miss the whole thing, you know, which was okay with me. But um, that evening, the Sunday, Saturday evening, I would be um, watching my favorite show, which was Shock Theater, and very late. And uh, she, bless her, she stayed up to, to be with me, but she was often already asleep in her chair while I was there alone with Frankenstein and Dracula, you know. But um, 
But this is a poem of comfort. And I have used some words from the hymn in the, in the poem, but you don't need to know those words in order to, to understand the poem. Come home. Tonight, the gloaming is a shadow box of corridors. Time dimmed like the Sunday school room of ancient ladies, my grandmother called Miss Informality. Miss Rose Davis, Miss Rose Harris. The ancient world mapped those yellowed walls. Paul's travels through Antioch in Syria, Macedonia, Athens, Corinth. Paul the tent maker mending the knotted nets converted in a flash to a fisher of men. Cicadas start late this summer, not yet a blast like Paul's fiery Damascus moment, more like my grandmother singing from the Broadman, her vibrato rising and settling around me, already asleep in her lap. Take me, take me, 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 me. They rapture in high fidelity, their invitation in the half light. Ye who are weary, come home. Nearing 70, my own gloaming, I watch only for the soft tint of night to fall. Insect voices I wait for all year call from the canopy, primitive and unnameable. The portals of home, always lit, always open, map where I've tripped and was pardoned beyond reason, blasted deaf and blind by mercy. Take me, I call, me, and they open wider still. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.